Well, good morning from London at the Financial Times. I'm Claire Barrett, the consumer editor of the paper and also a big advocate of financial literacy, which is why I'm chairing this very, very important session this morning to launch Global Money Week 2021. Now, what's so important about Global Money Week this year is number one, that all of the more than 100 countries who are involved have all come up with ways of celebrating Global Money Week entirely online using virtual events, videos, all kinds of innovative technology, quizzes, things to involve young people from around the world to get a better grip on their money management. Now, that's not the only thing that's amazing about Global Money Week. The second thing is, is that this information about financial literacy and capability has never been more needed. Young people have been the most affected financially by this pandemic. And unfortunately, if you're a young person watching this today, and we know that we have many of you on the call, which is fantastic, these effects are gonna go on much longer into the future after the restrictions for the coronavirus um, have gone away. So what can you do? Well, in the UK, my bank, who is the charity who is supporting the UK's um, Global Money Week activities, have told me that half of UK people in their 20s don't have any savings at all, so they have very low financial resilience. So we hope that as a result of our introduction session today and also as all of the things that are happening around the world in your own countries in Global Money Week, which we're going to hear more about from, from people in this session, that you'll be able to get the skills that you need to build those important life skills managing your own money for the future. So without further ado, I am going to hand over to Angul Guria, who is the Secretary General of the OECD for his opening remarks on this remarkable week. Angle, thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Your Majesty, dear colleagues, friends, um, and all the young people around the world who are watching. I am delighted to launch the um, 2021 Global Money Week and honored to be joined by Her Majesty, Queen Maxima of the Netherlands. Queen Maxima is a global champion of financial inclusion, of financial literacy, and who serves as both the United Nations Secretary General's special advocate for inclusive finance for development. Uh, she's an honorary patron of the G20 Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, and of course, a colleague, uh, of the OECD work in financial inclusion and financial literacy. I also had the honor of launching the PISA 2012 and the 2015 financial literacy results with Her Majesty. The OECD's interim economic outlook released earlier this month had a hopeful message. A strong global economic recovery may be in sight, but it is also underlined that the pandemic is increasing social inequalities, worsening the situation for many vulnerable groups. Our young people are among those who are suffering most from the crisis. Their access to education, job prospects, ability to thrive socially have all been badly hit. And all this is limiting their opportunities to build a secure financial future. The theme of Global Money Week this year, take care of yourself, take care of your money. It stresses the importance of building financial resilience to cope not with the current crisis, but also with future ones, thereby supporting financial well-being. Our young people need to be given the instruments the opportunities to build a better, more inclusive, more sustainable future for themselves, but also for the society that they live in. Financial literacy is one of those instruments, together with adequate financial inclusion, financial consumer protection, all these are absolutely indispensable frameworks. 
Yet young people are not always equipped with the financial skills they need. The PISA 2018, uh, PISA is the uh, uh, part of uh, program for international student assessment, you know, the PISA 2018 financial literacy assessment showed far too many students, one in six actually, across the OECD, which are the most developed countries, failed to attain even a baseline level of proficiency. As I said, even in high or middle performing countries. So while 54% of the 15 year old students have a bank account, almost 40% have made a payment with a mobile phone. Many cannot recognize the value of a simple budget let, let alone understand a bank statement or a pay slip. So the peace assessments also highlighted gender differences, especially in attitudes and opportunities to learn by doing. On average, boys were 12 percentage points more likely than girls to enjoy talking about money matters. And they were also more likely than girls to have used digital financial services. So we need to pay attention to such aspects to avoid gender differences in financial outcomes, because if that continues into adulthood, it can create widening chasms. The results for inclusiveness are also alarming. Students from a disadvantaged socioeconomic background score significantly lower in financial literacy than advantaged students. The OECD contribution to the 2020, uh, the, the G20 presidency, this is the Saudi uh, 2020 G20 presidency, on the field of advancing the digital financial inclusion of youth, advancing the digital financial inclusion of youth, also stressed the limited financial literacy and the inclusion of disadvantaged young people. And as with financial literacy, there is also a gender dimension to problems of financial inclusion. For example, with more and more women are you know, opening bank accounts, there is still a 7% global gender gap, meaning that 1 billion women, 1 billion women with a B are financially excluded. Moreover, gender gaps in financial literacy and financial inclusion are mutually reinforcing and they limit the development of female entrepreneurship and access to finance by women entrepreneurs. Now, the situation is particularly serious in developing countries, which is why I welcome Her Majesty's engagement in the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative, the WeFi. The OECD has for many years promoted financial literacy for all, especially for young people. The OECD recommendation in financial literacy adopted in October 2020 at the OECD's ministerial council meeting of last October, only a few weeks ago, encourages governments to take measures to develop financial literacy from the earliest possible age. Now, more than 75 countries around the world, 75 countries, are currently developing or implementing national strategies for financial education to ensure efficient coordination of financial literacy initiatives for all target audiences. But again, especially for the young. 
but more remains to be done. Global Money Week has an important role to play in this homework that we all have. Global Money Week, which the OECD is organizing for the first time this year, brings together stakeholders from the public, the private, and the not-for-profit sectors with a goal of improving the financial literacy of children and youth. The global importance of this topic is reflected in the participation of more than 100 countries in the Global Money Week this year. Despite the restrictions to almost exclusively virtual activities. And Global Money Week is not just a week. It's really an attitude. It's a state of mind. It catalyzes efforts that last for years, sometimes decades. So your majesty, your friends, young people everywhere, basic financial literacy can make a crucial difference in the opportunities and life prospects of young people. It is a foundation stone, a building block for lifelong well-being and for a more inclusive economy. It also has a key role to play in building forward better from the current crisis. Or rather, you know, as we like to say, well, more resilient, more inclusive, greener, and with greater financial inclusion and literacy. The OECD remains committed to advancing financial literacy for all and supporting you in your efforts. And now it is my great privilege to invite Queen Maxima to share with us her insights. Thank you. Ms. Aburria, thank you so much for uh, those amazing opening remarks. It is uh, incredible that after all these years, you have become yourself uh, the most fervent uh, advocate to financial inclusion, financial literacy and consumer protection. So. Uh, we will be missing you tremendously, at least I will. Uh, we uh, really work very nice together. So it is really a very, very big pleasure to join you today in this launch of the Global Money Week. Because this campaign is really so important uh, because the lessons that we learn as children can stick with us the rest of our lives. I still do remember when I was first taught to balance a budget as a child. There was this feeling of empowerment and a weight of responsibility, which accompanies this very simple act. One that really positively impacted and ever guided my financial behavior and decision making ever since. This comes as no surprise, of course. Research demonstrates that childhood financial experiences heavily influence adult financial well-being. The financial education of our daughters and sons represents the most effective path to instill and nurture sound financial behavior in future grown-ups. Furthermore, young people are good at spreading new habits to the rest of the population. The multiplier effects are clear. People with high levels of financial literacy tend to better save and manage credit, diversify investments, and prioritize retirement planning. They can make sound financial decisions. This leads to better economic well-being for themselves, their families, and their communities and societies as a whole, of course. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed the financial vulnerabilities of individuals and households across developed and developing countries. As we build back towards a more resilient future, like Mr. Borria said, it is critical to create an ecosystem that supports the financial resilience and financial health of today's youth. This means incorporating financial literacy as part of a broader strategy that promotes financial health. 
we should ask, how can we best equip our youth with the tools to thrive in the future? To build capacity to manage day-to-day -day expenses, prepare for economic shocks, plan ahead, and feel secure about their finances. This requires a reorientation of our financial literacy programs from simply transferring concepts and knowledge to cultivating healthy financial habits and decision-making. Consistent, coordinated messaging that is delivered in a sustained manner is key. Programs could be better designed based on data and evidence. It is important to consider young people's financial literacy levels, behaviors, and situations, along with the available mechanisms for learning inside and outside the classrooms. For instance, a five-year youth saving project in four emerging economies show that tailored saving products that were accessible in schools with strategic involved parent involvement and targeted SMS savings reminders helped 130,000 students accumulate almost 1 million US dollars in savings. The children's values and knowledge related to savings and budgets also improved in the process, along with their attitudes towards banks. Timing is crucial in delivering financial literacy messages, notably at moments of decision-making, such as points of sale or points of use of financial services. A study followed new account holders who received monthly or semi-monthly SMS reminders about how savings can help them achieve goals. The results showed significantly increased balances compared to those who did not receive these messages. So digital technology can help widely and quickly disseminate tailored content to young audiences through their preferred channels. Social media and other digital platforms could also be used to better understand youth's financial concerns, which can help craft and deliver more effective financial literacy messages. However, it is important to consider and address the reality that digital channels are not available for everyone. Financial literacy messages are reinforced with access to financial services that are well designed to the needs and capabilities of the young. For example, studies have shown while young people's savings goals vary depending upon their life stage, they usually save for a specific purpose. Reflecting this reality, in Colombia, accounts were programmed to enable youth to set saving goals. Nudges and incentives can also be built in, reinforcing positive financial habits. With increased and easier access to financial services, it is important that the youth understand the cost and benefits of products, the rights and obligations, and in turn, make optimal financial choices. Policy and regulatory environments should promote a system that informs, protects, and addresses concerns promptly and adequately. This will foster the needed trust in the financial system and the assurance that products and services consider customer voice and choice. There is a role for everyone. Collaboration among the public and private sector is necessary to ensure that financial education does not exist in a vacuum. Rather, it should be embedded in how curriculums are crafted, how financial products are designed and delivered, and how policies are formulated. Finally, I'm very pleased to note that the G20 Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion is highlighting the importance of financial capability in their agenda. In particular, this includes the work to increase awareness by individuals and SMEs of the risks and opportunities of digital finance. And together with the OECD, the report on the digital financial literacy to support financial resilience. Financial education will always be an important component to ensure that financial inclusion leads to positive outcomes and impacts for development. 
Congratulations to the Global Money Week for once again elevating the discussion on financial literacy and galvanizing global support. As UN Secretary General Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development, the GPFI on your patron, and the honorary chair of the Dutch MoneyWise platform, I look forward to continuing work together. Actually, today we launched our week here in the Netherlands, very digitally, but with half of all our children and education system involved. So I was really, really very proud of that. But it's just a week, and these efforts should go far beyond this week and help really our societies reap long-term gains from investing in the financial health of today's younger generation and help them in the future. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for your commitment and support. Well, thank you so much, um, Her Majesty Queen Maxima, and to the Secretary General, Angle Gurria. Absolutely fantastic opening um, to Global Money Week. And as you say, Money Week, it's not a week, it's a state of mind that will go on far beyond the seven days ahead of us. So without further ado, we are now going to play you um, a short video of young people's voices showing why financial education is important to them. I think it is important to save money because you don't know what will happen to you. Porque así puedo comprar ropa, juguetes y libros. I think that learning to take care of my money, the way I earn it, spend it and invest it, is very important. I believe saving money can help us plan for the future. ¿Y eso para qué ahorras? Para comida, para peluches y para cuarientos. ¡Ah, qué bien! It is important for us to manage our money wisely and so we don't face problems later on. It is important for us to not fall on any scams, not fall on any dodgy deals. Es importante de prendre soin de son argent para hacer face aux imprevus. Y aprendo que el dinero es un recurso que me permite reagir sobre cualquier imprevisto que pueda acontecer. I think that saving money can help us invest in our health and education. Porque cuando tienes dinero lo puedes guardar y lo utilizas cuando lo necesitas. As I'm a teenager, I don't have a stable source of income. So I'm asking for money from my parents. During these challenging times, I'm trying to save the money they give me to help my family to get out of this crisis. Intenta ahorrar lo más posible y no gastarlo de manera irresponsable. Optimizando, ahorrando en la casa financiera para luego hacer inversión. The best way is to share a portion to the needy ones. Nasihat saya macam mana kita nak jaga kewangan kita macam nak jaga duit adalah dengan uh, mungkin mengambil takaful, pastikan uh, anda ada insurance, rumah ada insurance, kereta ada insurance supaya anda tak perlu keluarkan kos yang banyak di masa hadapan. Terima kasih. Eu cuido meu dinheiro agora para deixar uma conta bancária em que só minha mãe tem acesso. Pois assim impede o meu gastá-lo. I said financial goals, having a budget helps me in reaching them. I would like to recommend my peers to start saving early, to have a budget and to differentiate their primary and secondary expenses. Uh, I would like to talk about 50, 30, 20 rules. It's easy way to manage your money, save your money, or control your money. 50% of your money uh, you can contribute to needs, 30% uh, to uh, wants, and 20% uh, to savings. I would like to know and learn how I can save money that I don't spend so that I can invest in my future and education. ¿Cómo funcionan los impuestos? Me gustaría aprender a cómo puedo ahorrar mi dinero. Sam que odlučate o pomembnih zadevah, gledaj kakove snega izobraževanja sporučava. 
da poskrbite in omogočite mladim kakovostno finančno izobraževanje. Alors, effectivement, pendant ces temps de crise, j'ai un peu de mal à gérer mon budget et on espère vraiment qu'avec Global Manui, qu'on va pouvoir apprendre à faire ça. Quisiera aprender sobre cómo invertir para poder tener ahorros en el futuro. Me gustaría aprender más sobre los productos que ofrecen los bancos y distintas herramientas para aumentar. It's pretty scary. Retirement funds, stocks, what do I invest in? So I would like to know where I can put my money so it grows. Well, <clears throat> what a fantastic film that was. So many great messages there from young people around the world who were planning ahead to deal with the unforeseen, being aware of scams. That's a really, really important part of financial education and learning about investing, not just in the stock market, as many of them said, but also in their future health and education. And it's wonderful to see how many young people around the world want to learn. But in the words of, of one of them, um, this stuff can be pretty scary. Um, we know that we have got lots of you um, on the call today, young people from around the world who want to hear a bit more about what top financial experts from around the world are urging you to do as young people for Global Money Week. So the next part of our um, session today, um, we're going to have a panel on financial literacy, which I've got lined up to speak to you, global leaders from financial regulatory authorities all around the world, but don't be scared of them because you know what? They were young once too, just like you. And we're gonna start off by introducing them all one by one. And they're each going to tell you a little story um, about how they handled money or what they wish that they had known about money when they were nearer your age. So one by one, um, I'm going to start with Magda Bianco, who is the head of consumer protection of the financial education department at the Bank of Italy. Now, Italy, obviously, is super important because they are the co-chair of the G20 Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion. Um, Magda, um, can I start by asking you what the most valuable financial lesson was that you learned when you were growing up, please? Thank you very much. Um, well, I guess the lesson refers to the value, to the importance of savings and the independence, the empowerment it gives you, as, as we actually heard from some of the uh, students that we heard now. Um, actually, when I was in high school, uh, I started working in the summer, one month of, of the summer, and um, this allowed me to save and then to finance my university studies. Of course, also many other small things among that. Um, this made me feel uh, really independent. It gave me a great freedom uh, and empowerment in choosing what I preferred to study, what I wanted to do afterwards. Uh, so that was really a, a great push. But on the other hand, I, I must say, of course, I was not so well equipped in terms of planning and choosing good instruments to make uh, my savings grow in a more effective way. So good things, but also something to learn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magda. And important to note, everybody makes mistakes. Even me at the Financial Times, I've written about lots of the mistakes that I've made. But you know what? If you make a mistake, you learn from it. So there can be a positive side to that too. But um, absolutely, you know, financial independence, um, especially for women, thank you, Magda, is a great, great thing to start off with. So secondly, we're going to move now to Anna Zelensova, who is from the Ministry of Finance, the Russian Federation and co-chair of the G20 Partnership for Financial Inclusion. Good morning, Anna. And I, the question I'm going to ask you is, what do you wish you knew about money when you were 18 years old? 
good morning good afternoon claire and everyone uh you know uh when i was 18 i wish would someone would say me that uh, you need pay first yourself so that otherwise you would never start to save you would never have money for yourself because you know i was born and grew up in soviet union we didn't have much financial instruments financial market and these days uh, even young people have already a lot of opportunities but you need to know how to start to do it and nobody thinking uh, when uh, you are 18 about retirement right about pension but what we see that the young people and especially girls especially young uh, women i would echo what magda said they already from 25 24 years old already save less than men already less prepared for their retirement so i would uh, love to know it when i was young and i would urge uh, young people right now and especially young girls to think about uh, the same investment opportunities as early as possible well, thanks. Another really important uh, point there, and certainly International Women's Day um, a couple of weeks ago, lots of very interesting but also very worrying um, financial statistics were, were released then about exactly that point. So we've got more positivity coming up, young people, don't worry. I'm going to move next to um, Mari McGuinness, who is the European Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability and Capital Markets Union. Um, Mari, can you tell us what was the most most valuable financial lesson that you learned when you were growing up, please? Well, look, I'm delighted to be part of this great event today. And the valuable lesson I learned was on a family farm. So there were eight children. And in a sense, I had the benefit of both entrepreneurial experience and dealing with cash. So we dealt with people who came to the farm to buy our produce. And I think I'm very lucky because I had that experience. So I learned very quickly that money did not grow on trees and that you really did have to work to earn money. And therefore I had a value on money because I knew that it would bring independence. I also was really lucky. My mother was very much um, equality minded. So her five daughters and her three sons were treated equally. And she was on the checkbook with my father at a time when many women were not on the checkbooks of their husbands at the time. So I feel that I've had a great grounding in finance. And I'm also aware that you can lose money and I'm conscious that, you know, there's a risk to all of this. So I hope that out of today's event, we'll all see money as an enabler, not just the having of it to hoard it, but an enabler. Those young people who spoke about education and opportunity um, and also to be responsible. So in one sense, being from a family farm, very large uh, family, the only thing that disappointed me a little was once when I produced my little notebook about all the work I'd done on the farm and had priced it. I didn't get paid. So to some extent, you didn't always get paid with money on a family farm, but you got rewarded with opportunity for education that came from our collective effort. Fantastic answer. And, and, and also very relevant because handling cash, um, you know, in a Saturday job or working for your parents' business, I mean, now that particularly the pandemic has sped up this move to digital payments. I mean, even I find it harder to keep track of what I'm tapping to, to spend with my contactless card. Mm -hmm. True, absolutely. We all have to be a bit more careful with all of these instant opportunities. Absolutely, although there are more digital tools, of course, that we can use to, um, to keep track of our money in different ways. Now, I'm going to move next um, around the world further to Brazil. Uh, we've got Marcelo Barbosa, who is the chairman of the Securities and Exchange um, Commission, CBM, um, in Brazil. Now, Marcello, I believe you um, are going to tell me about how you are teaching your own children about money, which, um, as Mari said, very important point for parents to instill the right messages. Yes, thank you. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Well, I think it's it's interesting to to hear from from the, the previous speakers, because I have two daughters. So um, I, want, I want my daughters to be, first of all, independent throughout their lives. So we talk openly about money, but I don't want them to, at the age they are now, they are still too young, they are 13 and eight. I want them to know that they can ask me questions, they can understand all the issues revolving around money, but they don't need to feel anxious. So I want them to, feel, to be able to, to plan for the long future, 
to plan to know that there are unexpected events in their lives and this is uh, uh, only reinforcing the need for savings and in general we talk about the value of work I, I always uh, uh, talk to them about what I do at work I know it's a bit complicated for them at their age but it's it's always good that they they keep coming back to questions they listen to in, in social media you, you can you can uh, uh, certainly understand what I'm what I'm talking about, but th the good thing is that I feel that the girls are of their age they have less difference from the boys when when I see their friends talking about, and this is something that I look forward to to seeing them growing more and more in the future. So it's open uh, uh, discussions, uh, not having them feel anxious about it because they are not. Uh, they are still too young to, to, to feel anxious about money, but they need to understand and to have the tools. Well, a great answer. And also, you know, one of the silver linings uh, perhaps to the, to the pandemic has been because children and parents have been at home and, you know, parents like me have been working from home. It gives the children a real insight into what we actually have to do um, to, to earn money. And sometimes um, they can be a bit surprised <laughs> what our jobs actually actually involve. But thank you so much for that, Marcello. Now I'm going to move now um, to Alano. We've got Alano on the call. Alano Macabella, who is the Acting Commissioner for the Financial Sector Conduct Authority in South Africa. Um, now, Alano, you are going to tell us what the most valuable lesson you learned, the most valuable financial lesson you learned growing up. Yeah. Thank you so much, Claire, and good day to everyone. I must say, after watching those videos, um, I'm very much heartened. I, I think we are on the right path. So I have to tell you a little story here. Um, so when I was growing up, my parents uh, brought to me this ATM bank card. And, and the only thing you could use it for was to actually save. Well, and we withdraw a little bit of money. But because I wasn't working, it could never operate as a check account. So it actually forced me to save <laughs> because that was the main thing. You could never withdraw money you don't have <laughs> in it. And so from that day on, um, you know, I've um, inculcated this culture of saving. Um, and it starts at a very young age. And I remember the day I was so excited because this card was being offered by one of our banks in South Africa. And it was called a Bob T, Bob um, T for teenager. And, and since then, Claire, I've appreciated the need to also automate savings. So since I've been young, I've literally ran debit orders on my bank account for my savings on the day I get my salary, which means as Anna was saying, you are actually paying yourself. Um, and, and so it helps with that human behavior, that discipline, because I, I can just rely on the bank and the system to make sure that the money every month um, gets saved in the various uh, financial institutions. And, 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 and with time you realize how important it is to save. You don't need to rely on short-term uh, debt uh, you are able to save beyond retirement, and that gives you a certain sense of financial uh, independence and well-being. So I would say definitely saving at all costs. That's a really brilliant lesson, and I think that the most important thing um, for people who are watching on the call to think about building up, obviously, is the emergency fund, you know, a pot of money that can give you you know choices in life if something goes wrong something bad happens something unexpected but then as you begin to get older and earn a bit more in a regular job then there are lots of savings um, as Alane says on the first day that you get paid that's the day when you need to put the savings into the pension into investments you know to get used to not having that money sloshing around in your bank account because otherwise you'll very easily find things to to spend it on and budgeting experts call this pay yourself first um, yes. and i've written about it in a in a financial times column for global money week which you can find if you use that hashtag gmw2021 we'll tweet it out and instagram it again later now last but not least um, we have guru Muth 
Timothy um, Mohalligan, who is the commissioner of SEBI, the Securities and Exchange Board of India. Um, now, for the last of our little anecdotes, you're going to tell us what you wish you knew about money when you were 18. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be a part of this celebration of Global Money Week by OECD. Uh, you are taking me back to my childhood. 18 years, what was, what was I thinking about money? I think the most important thing that I had in money about money was where does money grow? Because I've always heard people telling that money does not grow on trees. So where does it grow? So people told me that it doesn't grow anywhere at all. It is produced by the central bank. The central bank prints some money and puts it out into circulation. The next question I used to ask my teachers was that why can't the central banks print any amount of money so the country becomes richer and richer and richer? They said, no, that's not such an easy solution at all. The central bank just cannot put out that kind of a money. I think they have to have a limited capacity of production of money because otherwise the country will get into economic problems. So that's where for the first time I realized that money cannot come in abundant supply. It has to come in a very limited supply. And if I want to grow the money in my own pockets, I think I need to really save that, which means the first thing that I need to do is to go and open a bank account. And to think of opening a bank account in India in those days was a kind of, I mean, going into a bank itself is a kind of a real picnic. It's a kind of a trip. You were, because there was no digital technology, nothing. It was a human to human interaction. You go and present your check out there across the counter and they pay you money. But there is a greatly interesting experience because for the first time you started handling money in an independent way and you were allowed to go out to a bank and withdraw money. And when you see in the money bank's counter stacks and stacks of bank notes, you are thrilled. You are, it was really, really great to imagine that kind of notes in your pocket. But then later I realized if I want that kind of notes in my pocket, I need to save it very carefully. I need to really put it into very uh, uh, ca carefully calibrated investment plans. So that became a very important lesson in my life. Thank you very much. Oh, well, that's that's really great. A lo lovely um, visual image of um, all of the, the, the stacks and stacks of money um, in the bank. But thank you, everyone, for kicking us all off with a personal um, recollection from your childhood of what you've all learned about money. And do remember, everyone watching at home, you know, we were all young once and we all did make mistakes and we have all learned from them. And look at us now um, <laughs> in the financial world doing our thing. So you can do it, too. Now, for the next part of our session, we're going to be talking about what different countries around the world are doing for Global Money Week and why financial literacy is of so much relevance to young people in those countries. So again, going back to, to Magda Bianco, please, could you tell us, Magda, what is the relevance of financial literacy for young people and Global Money Week for the G20 and for the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, which you are the co-chair of, please? Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, well, financial and economic literacy, I think, is an essential tool for, as we said, for freedom, for empowerment, for well-being. For young people, it is really core um, in becoming owner of the future. And at the same time, I think, uh, really active and aware citizens. Um, financial education at school is fundamental also to provide equal opportunities by reducing the weight of family background and through this reducing inequalities. I think this is really important. It is, as we heard, an empowering tool, especially for women and for other vulnerable segments of the society, uh, because it helps uh, in, in increasing, in boosting their confidence, in enhancing awareness uh, on what is available in the, in, the finance, uh, in the finance environment, opportunities, but also risks. And hence, this encourages a, a much pro proactive and, and responsible inclusion into the financial system. And I would say at the Bank of Italy, as, as a central bank, in a sense, we promote financial inclusion also as a part of somehow our responsibilities uh, in, the wider, in the wider context of ensuring financial stability and consumer protection. That is, this is another uh, reason for, for, for uh, encouraging financial literacy. 
Uh, well, these principles are certainly very widely recognized in the, in the international community, and specifically, as you said, uh, in the um, Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, with, which I have the honor to co-chair together with Anna and then so on. Um, financial inclusion, and now especially digital financial inclusion, uh, needs financial literacy to be effective. It really needs it. And hence, identifying good practices of digital financial literacy that favor inclusion uh, will be a key priority for the GPFI this year under the Italian presidency, as uh, Queen Maxima was underlining. Uh, we have designed together with the OECD a specific deliverable that will deal exactly on this, uh, with this, how digital financial literacy can improve financial inclusion and resiliency for individuals, but also for micro and small enterprises. The, no, the Global Money Week couldn't be more timely this year. This week, uh, uh, we with the GPFI will have our first uh, plenary meeting and the awareness created by the Global Money Week will, be, will create great synergies. Uh, we should really try to get most uh, from the digital format of the Global Money Week this year. Despite the limitations that the pandemic is imposing, uh, we should use this as an opportunity to learn also from a methodological point of view, <laughs> what does and what does not work when it comes uh, uh, to engaging the young population also through online instruments. Thank you. Thank you, Magda, a fantastic answer. And I think when it comes to digital financial literacy and inclusion, there are so many opportunities, you know, there are great fintech apps out there that can make it easy to nudge people into savings, especially in better habits. But there's also an awful lot of, of temptation and bad advice um, on social media platforms like Instagram, Facebook, um, Snapchat, you know, people may be tempting you to either spend money on products or to invest in, um, in, in things that are scams. So, you know, you really do need to, to, to be aware, um, young people on the call, about what you're up to. There's lots of people, unfortunately, who, who are there to prey on you. Now, um, going to Anna now. Now, Anna, Russia has been promoting financial literacy in the global agenda at the G20, at APEC. Have those issues become more relevant, especially for young people, as a result of the pandemic? Yes, uh, absolutely. You are right. Russia has been promoting this agenda together with the OECD for many years. And I remember in 2012, uh, finance ministers of EPIC said that financial literacy should be a necessary life skill for everyone in 21st century. And now we see that it's even more relevant during this shock, during this pandemic situation. And as many uh, previous speakers already said that, uh, yes, families lost uh, uh, income, some families, some young people have all this social isolation and less access to quality education, including financial education. Uh, recent graduates. My daughter just graduated last year from the university. She was lucky to get job, but many of her classmates didn't get the job, even they had good, uh, uh, good education. So there are many uh, risks and many challenges, but there are also opportunities. And I think we need to help young people to go through this period and uh, become even more empowered. So I think it's great momentum right now to widespread financial education even bigger in the world. And thanks to the OECD for leading this Global Money Week. It, it's really not only one week. I think we need to incorporate financial education in schools curriculum. We need to do it on the consistent systematic uh, base. And of course, uh, we need uh, to use digital tools as we're trying to do right now. We need to um, talk with young people in a common language, the same language, and uh, use these opportunities. I have a big uh, hope and uh, in our young people, I think they are very responsible, not only in uh, matters of money, but also planet, uh, you know, ecology. So we need to help them. And actually, we even have something to learn from them. Um, I, com I completely agree. And the only th thing I would add to that, Anna, is that 
Um, but, you know, there are there are lots of things older people on the call can do to help young people just answering their questions, especially when they're in this awful period of applying for jobs and being rejected, being rejected, being rejected. Um, there are lots of children of my neighbours where I live in London who are going through this. And because they know me as their neighbour, they've been asking me, well, could you have a look at my CV or is there anything that I could be doing or am I pitching? Am I selling myself in the wrong way or could you have a look at my LinkedIn and just helping a young person? person like that could really make the difference um, between them being offered an interview or, or not so so do do a good deed now coming back to Mari now um Mari how is financial literacy relevant to the European Commission can you tell us please well look I want to just agree with the other two speakers who come before me but of course it's hugely relevant to the European Union because if you have a financially literate um, citizen then you have somebody who can make good choices uh, both now and for the future so when I took over this role I really wanted to put people at the center of it not just infrastructures uh, and all those cold things that go with the financial system but in order for, to put people at the very center we need them to know about finance how it works and how it will work for them. A really interesting point in my work now is around sustainable finance. A lot of young people want to see us change our ways. We want to be more green, more resilient, more sustainable. And we want to try and make money flow towards these projects. So I would say to young people who are saving and if they are investing, clearly you need information and knowledge uh, as to where you invest, but you should also look towards those products that are investing in the future, not the past. And I think there's a huge opportunity for a young generation that is environmentally very aware to do that. So a lot of our work is quite cross-cutting. Um, we don't have, if you like, an education remit, but everywhere I go to schools, uh, well, virtually now, of course, is how we all go, but wherever I speak to groups, I talk about financial literacy. The gender issue has already been addressed, how for women, uh, there is a real need to up the financial literacy skills. What really troubled me before I ever took this job was when people have no money, and they get access from um, loan sharks, as we would call them, or, or money lenders, they pay exorbitant rates of money when there might have been other opportunities to get that same money at lower interest rates. So I'd like us to really look after the disadvantaged so that they know where to go if they are in need in terms of getting access to funds. It has always troubled me from a, a moral point of view that those who couldn't afford it were charged the most when they needed money. And I think that's a global problem and we need to tackle it head on. So while we're looking at investments in pensions, in the future and sustainability, sometimes at the very basis here, just when people need money for a particular reason, a tragedy in the family or whatever, we need to look after those that are most vulnerable. And you know, knowledge is really power. And I think for young people to know how, how financial systems work and also how they don't work and to be careful of the risks involved in jumping into something, you know, at schools now, children are talking about Bitcoin, uh, stable coins, all of these things that really I was only talking about money when I was at that stage. And these are concepts we almost the older ones here need to actually ask young people about where, what they're discussing around finance so that we can really answer their questions. So it's a very exciting time for us here in the Commission where the financial DG, if you like, the area I'm responsible for, is now looking at sustainability looking at non-financial issues and that money will be the driver of change and young people I think want to drive that change so it's a core part of my work here. Brilliant well you've fantastically uh, set up my next question um, to Marcello now we know that in in Brazil um, green finance is a hugely um, big topic now how, how relevant is green finance to young people's financial futures please? A great deal, a great deal, um, definitely, because the younger generations, they are much more conscious, uh, obviously, about the future, and they know that uh, their future and the future of the generations to follow depend on what we are doing now for the, for the environment. And uh, to the extent that, the, um, that financing instruments, they, are, they have more positive effects, or at least neutral effects, to the environment, they will tend to engage, to accept, and to make use of those of those uh, uh, instruments. And 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 more than ever, they want to know more about what the what the securities issuers are doing about the environment, how they are tackling 
climate change risk? And this is actually a, a very timely, a very timely question because we are right now moving forward with an agenda here to ask companies to uh, disclose more information on the ESG topics. This is a very exciting time now, and we are receiving strong support from, from segments of the society that usually are not so engaged in discussions of regulatory reform and securities markets, because we are moving forward with this, uh, uh, with promoting disclosure on the ESG agenda. So, uh, uh, like I said, uh, uh, the younger generations, they are taking charge of the lives of the future, and they know that uh, that their investments, if they have a, a, a green based, a sustainable base, they will have a positive impact on the futures and the, and the futures of the generations to follow. Well, thank you very much. Great answer and a hugely important topic, not just for young people, but also for, for old people like us. But Alano, I'm going to move to you now. Now, could you tell us a little bit about what the key challenges are of the pandemic financially for young people in South Africa, please? Thank you, Claire. Um, so South Africa has had a very deep uh, unemployment rate. Um, and to be honest, it has been around with us um, well before even COVID. So we currently see that at, at the rate of 32% um, unemployment in South Africa. It has affected um, deeply and mostly the youth. And so, um, um, we ran a survey which we were assisted by one of our universities in South Africa, University of Cape Town. And it's very interesting what came out of the, the survey. So firstly, it showed that um, at least around 60% of our youth are very worried about the effects of the pandemic. Secondly, it indicated that um, a number of them have been hit hard by the pandemic in the form of them losing money. Because some of them have decided to start business or small business and become entrepreneurs. And because of the lockdowns linked to the, um, to the pandemic, they, they had to also shut down their, their business. And so they have incurred uh, some losses. 28% of them indicated that they were forced to borrow. And already South Africa has got a high indebtedness um, uh, rate. And so the pandemic just compounded the, um, the debt problem in the country. Then 32% indicated that they couldn't look for jobs um, because as most of us would know, once the pandemic hit, uh, government um, literally locked down um, the economy, et cetera. So, so the youth could not even make you know, um, an effort um, and, and try to at least search for jobs because no business was open <laughs> at that time. So it, it has had a very deep um, uh, impact. Um, and I always say, you know, if there's one sector in our society which has to be optimistic, it's the youth. Um, they, they really need to keep the faith. And you know, life is a cycle. Uh, life uh, as with the, the economy, as with politics, it's a cycle. You go through different phases. And so this one will also pass. It, it might take a bit of time, but, but it will also pass. So the need to be optimistic is really important. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Well, and, and I, I just think that's such a, an important message. You know, if there's one section of society that does need to be um, positive about the future, it is young people. Now, I'm going to move now to Guru Murthy in India. Can you tell us briefly, how do you bring financial literacy to such a large population? That must be quite a challenge. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's really, really challenging. You know, our country's population is right now about 1.25 billion. And uh, we have roughly about 120,000 bank branches, brick and mortar branches I'm talking about, not just the uh, telemachines. So these are the branches which cater to the financial savings of this kind of a population. Now, even then, I would not say that we have been able to reach up to the nooks and corners of the country. 
geographically, the country is spread across a vast area and some of the areas are really not accessible at all. But then we are doing an integrated effort amongst all the four regulators, the financial regulators put together. There is a securities market regulator, there is a central monetary authority, there is an insurance regulator, and there is a pension fund regulator, along with the Ministry of Finance. Uh, in line with the efforts which are being initiated by OECD, we are now started a national center for financial education, which is a non-profit center, and where the contributions have come in from all these regulators, and all these uh, regulators have floated this center, and this center is now come up with a strategy for financial education. Now, prior to this, SEBI, the securities regulator, had already a very unique model. The unique model envisaged that about 700 districts of the country, district is the unit of administration in the country, almost a large majority of these districts are covered by a special category of people called resource persons. These resource persons were engaged from the people who are from the academic community, like retired school teachers, retired college professors, and others who are interested in the financial markets. And they were engaged actually to conduct programs all across the country. I'm very happy and proud to say that about 100,000 programs have been conducted by these people, by these resource persons covering about 5.4 million people. This is a huge, huge effort which has gone in. Now, there, there's another important step that we are taking is that we have actually liaised with all the schools across the country and the governments, the provincial governments across the country to include financial literacy as a part of the educational curriculum. And I'm very happy to say that many of the provincial governments have actually included that as a part of the school curriculum. It becomes a part of the exam schedule. So people have to really study up as a part of the syllabus of the school. The third important step that we are taking is the multimedia awareness campaigns. Now, this multimedia awareness campaigns is a twofold objective. One is to increase the awareness of people. And number two, to prevent misselling, which, is, which could be very rampant in a population which has a large number of illiterates also. So with this kind of two folded objectives, our multimedia awareness campaigns have been a real great success. We have also brought out a booklet, which will be help, helpful to a lot of these people. And I'm again very happy to say that we have brought out a booklet in Brain, which is really helping the visually challenged persons also. We are guided in all these by the efforts of OECDs, International Network on Financial Education. I'm very happy to say that SEBI is an active participant in this international network, and we are thankful to OECD for all these efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, very comprehensive answer, listing all of the ways, as, as Queen Maxima said, that we need to bake this into the education of our, of our children in so many different ways. Now, for the final part of our session today, we're quickly going to ask all of the panellists to tell us what their respective countries are doing um, for Global Money Week. So, Magda, I'm going to come back to you first. Could you tell us what Italy is doing for Global Money Week 2021 and how it relates to the global global pandemic situation, please. Thank you. Uh, well, for the first time, uh, the 2021 edition of the Global Money Week is being coordinated at the national level by the National Committee for Financial Education, which has been working in Italy for a few years. I think this is an important step forward uh, to which we are contributing as a central bank uh, because uh, with this general coordination at the national level, we received a large number of event proposals, including, of course, webinars for students, for teachers, but also a large number for parents, which is very interesting, I think, uh, as well as educational activities like video tutorials, online games. Um, actually, more than 90% of these events uh, come from new participants uh, to the Global Money Week. Um, there is uh, institutions, stakeholders that join the Global Money Week for the first time. Uh, confirming the effectiveness uh, of the coordination, but also the attention that is being given more and more uh, by institutions. Maybe because possibly we created a couple of years ago um, the uh, month, uh, uh, the, the financial education month, which is in October, 
and this probably helped creating awareness on the issues. Uh, of course, the activities are related to the Global Money Week theme, the topic, take care of yourself, take care of your money. Um, I had prepared a, a sort of a slide with, uh, with the main names, the main uh, issues that, that um, uh, were relevant uh, this year. Um, many of them are actually directly or indirectly related to the pandemic. Uh, for example, the issue of financial resilience, uh, with the topic of savings, of planning, uh, the issue of online financial instruments, uh, the, the payments mainly, but not only, with their opportunities, but uh, uh, especially their risks, as we were saying before. Uh, but also, in general, the issue of risk uh, and financial decision main, making. Also, the issue of sustainable finance uh, is one of the topics. Um, also, although, of course, the pandemic limits somehow school participation and also the supply of educational activities, schools are actually responding very positively. Um, we, as, as a central bank, we are proposing to classes uh, an activity, a game um, on payment instruments uh, on, a, on a platform. And um, we are reaching an, a large number of students. Uh, they are reacting, reacting positively. Uh, regardless of whether they are attending physically the school or digitally. Uh, so we think uh, it will be a great week, this one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magda. Now turning to Anna in Russia, what is Russia doing for Global Money Week um, this year and how is it relating to the situation with the pandemic? Uh, Russia participates in Global Money Week from 2015, and this year, first time, we do everything digital. And Ministry of Finance uh, established special national financial literacy center, which coordinates this work. And it's a variety of different digital formats, starting from uh, very popular cartoons uh, for youngest ones, and then quizzes, quests uh, for older ones, and then public uh, talks, uh, debates for uh, young people who already high school students and uh, university students. So many the different uh, formats. But what is important, uh, as uh, already was said, that social media, social uh, networks play important role. Uh, surveys show that about half of uh, young people uh, learn financial matters from social networks and social media. So we decided to go to do those platforms which are already popular among young people because they not always provide correct information correct advice so we decided to partner with these platforms and invite our financial experts including finance minister to participate in that but also young people young people who are very relevant to this audience who are very popular among this audience so we organize joint public debates and other topics Talk, public talks together with them. Young people who already own their own money, who can uh, explain importance of credit score or importance of taxes and other topics. So we uh, uh, have a variety of such uh, formats, but of course, all of them are digital and we develop digital tools uh, for young people. And what is uh, the last thing, what is important? Young people uh, uh, feel themselves very uh, good in internet. So they know everything about internet, but sometimes because they feel uh, like fish in water, they forget about security. So we, of course, discuss with them issues of scams, of uh, other uh, potential problems to empower them uh, to be even more uh, digitally financial literate. So I, I would like just to celebrate and, uh, uh, and congratulate all of us with starting of Global Money Week. <laughs> well, thank you, Anna. And I have to say, as somebody who has um, started doing Instagram in the last six months in a big way, trying to get, like you say, the right financial messages out there to young people. As an older person, you do have to think quite hard um, in order to let the message translate, but it really does resonate. And, you know, it is a wonderful area for people to learn more about financial literacy if, as you say, the content that they're consuming is giving them the right advice. It's certainly where their eyeballs are. Um, now, coming to Marcello now, could you tell us what Brazil is doing, please, for Global Money Week? 
Of course, happy to. Um, so this year, um, there will be several events in Brazil coordinated by us, by the CVM and um, approximately 25 partner institutions who have a number of workshops, webinars, podcasts, radio, TV programs, uh, courses for students and, and teachers, and uh, financial gui uh, guidance clinics. Also, we'll make um, a lot of use of uh, social media to publicize marketing actions, such as Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. And we have created a website, GMW Brazil, um, which will consist of a hub of financial education content focused on children and young people. And will provide uh, uh, a lot of financial education materials, such as short videos, booklets, articles, distance learning courses, guides, games, contests, infographics, um, ebooks. There's a lot of content uh, in there. And also there will be a specific area at the website for teachers with uh, several videos and e-learning classes and guidelines. And we are also relaunching a number of uh, um, materials that we have prepared and, and uh, updated in the last uh, years with success, such as the second edition of our uh, uh, sustainability guide, social media campaign posts on sustainable finance, uh, the new version of our own CVM uh, app, including materials on investment funds, and the second season of the CVM educational podcast for young people. Um, last year's uh, five episodes in the new teaser, they are uh, already live and we are launching the uh, second season, as I said. The website is gmw.investidor.gov.br <coughs> and we are also launching a new edition of a contest that we have every year for the, the young people on, on savings where they can uh, where we award the best uh, short videos, the best podcasts and other uh, initiatives. It's all, uh, it, it has been a, a very successful initiative year after year. And we believe that it's, uh, uh, it's, um, it's more than enough to engage the younger generations and to come back with uh, positive results. Well, great to hear how you're really embracing um, the, the digital potential um, of Global Money Week, because I think that podcasts, I, I present a podcast called Money Clinic, where we speak to a real life person about a money problem every week and listening in. Obviously, you can learn a lot from what people are going through themselves, because also often we don't like to talk about it when we get into difficulties um, with our finances. It's a source of shame. And I'm trying with my podcast to, to eradicate that. But I will definitely have a listen um, to yours. So thank you very much. Now, moving on to Alano now, can you tell us about the role of Global Money Week in South Africa, please? Yeah, thank you, Claire. Um, so let, let me start with the first part, um, which focuses more on how financial literacy can help. You know, there's so much information on the internet. I mean, there's literally tons and tons of information. Yet, not everyone has got access to the internet, right? Um, and so as you, you know, focus on various regions and countries, you, you start realizing that, you know, access to information and knowledge is not, you know, always that um, easily available. And hence, you know, I've been wondering whether, you know, as governments, as companies, as NGOs, shouldn't we put, you know, effort and investment in establishing what I would call e-libraries, right? And as much as we are going to the digital space, you, you probably still need libraries where you can provide um, internet access, where you can provide uh, desktops, because you still need a computer or some kind of gadget to access the internet. And as I was saying, you know, not everyone has got those gadgets. And I think it's something, I think it's something for us to really think about, about especially for, for, for those people and youth who might not, you know, um, be staying around cities or be as privileged as us. Secondly, Claire, um, it's the whole issue around how do we help our youth who are innovative and start business to navigate these difficult times. 
I mean, you could you could reasonably say if you have um, understood and mastered how to manage your finances, you can relatively easily translate that to how to manage a company. But the two are still different. The two are still different. And, and so maybe evolving our financial literacy to enable, you know, and equip our youth with practical um, lessons and training on how to cope. Uh, under these current circumstances and how to manage a company under this stress. Then Clay, if I can go to what we are doing in South Africa, I mean, the timing is so perfect for us because today is our human rights uh, day. And actually as I was waking up, I was asking myself, maybe we probably need to introduce a new right <laughs> in our constitution, which is actually, you know, the right to financial independence and, um, and knowledge, information, accurate information. And so I'm glad to say as of today, we, we will be launching our uh, Money Week in South Africa. It will be live streamed um, on www.mwsa.co.za and it will be for free. So it will not cost anyone you know, their data to be able to access uh, and, 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 and share. And so we have invited various regulators, various training um, institutions, companies, so that they can provide um, unbiased, unbiased information on their various products and how they can be utilized. And just to take this uh, opportunity to thank the Global uh, Money Week um, and also our partners in, in, in South Africa for, yeah. for coming up with such a, a, a useful um, initiative, which as everyone was saying, I don't think it should actually be just for this week. It should actually be something we live by um, every month. So thank Indeed. you so much. To the OEC. A way of life. Well, thank you so, so much for that. And really important point about helping young people run their business finances. Now, Guru Murthy, could you briefly tell us about the role of Global Money Week in, in India? And then we'll come to, to Mari, but we're, we're nearly at time. So if you could keep it brief, that would be fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Uh, out of the total population of about 1.21 billion, 25 billion in the country, 35% of the population is in the age group of 18 to 34 years. So we are specially targeting this Global Money Week towards the younger section of the population. The vision of the Global Money Week is to ensure that all children and youth have access to high quality financial education to learn about money matters and are able to take smart decisions. Now, here what we have done is more than 600 webinars are planned across the country, across the 26 provinces and the union territories of the country. Additionally, we are going to hold a large number of essay competitions where actually people will be right to make, uh, given an opportunity to write out their ideas. We are also going to hold some interesting quiz competitions which will cover the basics of finance. We are also actually as a part of the uh, entire global money we the media campaigns are going to be a part and parcel of it. And we have created a micro site in our Investar website for the Global Money Week, giving all details about it. And there are quite a lot since you said that I need to be brief. I'm just curtailing here. Thank you. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Do check out the website. And then finally, last but not least, to, to Mari, can you tell us, please, to sum up what policymakers can do, you, do you think, to help young people with financial literacy, both now and in the future? Well, look, immediately, I think what's happened today is fantastic because I've learned lots of uh, interesting ideas from just being on this panel. I really like the idea of resource persons, these retired people that's happening in India. So that's a really good idea. But on a policy level at European, um, uh, at the level I work at, we don't have the competence for education. However, member states are really keen for us to give them some frameworks around financial literacy, because as we're hearing today, money uh, does make the world go around. And for individuals, how you handle money, your awareness of it, uh, your ability to ask questions will determine not just your financial health, but ultimately your health. Because if you're not looked after well financially, sadly, people have poor health outcomes. So this is about, if you like, making sure that we don't leave anyone behind. And really what one message I would like to get across today is that we want to make money work for us 
not the other way around. And part of my mission in my role here in, in DG FISMA in the European Commission is to, you know, human, if you like, put the human at the center of all our policies, make money work for us, more sustainability, addressing climate change, biodiversity loss, making sure that we answer the questions of young people, not just around money today, but around the use of money and try to root out its abuse. One of the things we haven't talked about at all is how money is abused in the system, money laundering, you know, terrorism financing. So we need to have a, a really, if you like, financially alert citizen, old and young, so that we have the best outcomes for society as we go forward. So really lovely to link up with you all virtually and someday I hope maybe we could meet physically. So good luck to everyone who's online, especially to our young people. Well, thank you. So at this point, I'm going to say thank you to the panel, to Magda, to Anna, to Mari, Marcello, Alano and Guru Murthy. And do remember the theme of Global Money Week. Take care of yourself. Take care of your money. And as we've heard from so many of our panellists, you know, take care of your future and also take care of the planet. All really important messages for young people watching today. Now, at this point, I'm going to hand over to Floran Messing, who is head of consumer finance, insurance and pensions at the OECD. Um, Floran, thank you for a great event today and over to you. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as we used to say for these virtual events. Uh, we are at the end of uh, the global launch, but very much at the beginning of the Global Money Week. So first, happy Global Money Week to you all. Uh, it's the end of the global launch and there's been many national launch today. I won't cite them all, but I know that all of the countries watching have been very, very active starting today. So well done, all of you. I'd like also to say that we have many people uh, on Zoom right now listening to us. So I'd like to say hello to you and young people also on YouTube. So hello from any countries you're watching from. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you. Uh, this launch, as I said, well, is the beginning of the week. And I think one of the main feature, one of the main strengths, I think, and it's been said by many uh, panelists today, uh, is uh, the strength of the Global Money Week is really that it is bringing together a wide range of stakeholders that may have different interests in normal times, but are bringing together uh, with a common goal. And the common goal is really make money part of the conversation, not making a taboo, not fear money, just really talk about it with our young people in order to ensure that you know, it can support their financial well-being in the future. It can help them have more opportunities. And I think when we are not speaking really about money here, we are speaking about lives, future lives, and more opportunities in future lives. So very important to keep that in mind. I'd like to say that one of the strengths I said, bringing together many stakeholders is really uh, this comprehensive mobilization, this cooperation uh, among different stakeholders is really key to this initiative. And here I'd like to salute because we've, been, we've heard a lot about the OECD coordinating, but I would like to pay a tribute to the founder of the Global Money Week, uh, uh, Jérôme Bill, Bill Moria, who has been really key in mobilizing all of us at the time when she created this initiative. And I still, uh, you can see that this initiative is, is you know, is a long-term one now. And we are very happy at the OECD uh, to take that on board. Of course, cooperation for us is key at the OECD. It is at the core of our recommendation on national strategy for financial literacy. So is recognition of contribution and achievement. And in that spirit, I would like uh, to thank all of those that have been involved in the launch of today and in the Global Money Week. I can't really be exhaustive because there are too many, but uh, I'll try my best really. I'd like to start by a, a big thank you. And it's been an honor, uh, of course, to have Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands in her capacity of UN Secretary General, a special advocate for inclusive finance for development. Uh, Her Majesty has been supporting, as you've heard, uh, the Global Money Week for a number of years, and we are very pleased for her support uh, today and her support, of course, to, to the Dutch Money, Money Week. Thank you to our OECD uh, Secretary General. It's great to have his support, obviously, but I'd like to thank especially you panelists, uh, not only for your, you know, your expertise on this issue, but also for your candor, for sharing you know, what you wanted to learn as a young person or what you are teaching your kids. I think it is extremely important for, for young people to understand that there is no shame. And Claire said it very well, uh, quite often money is a taboo. When you have financial difficulty, you are 
a shame of yourself and then you're not speaking about it. And I think the Global Money Week, it's its strength is really to bring this discussion and to learn that there is no fear. Actually, when I started working uh, on financial literacy a long time ago, we were often quoting a survey that was saying that people were more stressed about money issues than going to the dentist. So I think that says it all. I think what we should do is exactly what Claire is doing. And I want to thank Claire very much uh, for, for accepting to moderate is to make it, you know, a general subject uh, of discussion. Uh, mentioning just the fact that having a budget is going a long way to help you making choice for your future. Not try to really understand that there is nothing to be scared about and that by, by practicing, you will see that you can make a difference in your life. So thank you, Patanis, for your expertise, for also mentioning the importance of, of financial literacy in, in the policy agenda, in the global one, in the European one, but also at your national level. And at the OECD, we keep stressing that financial literacy is part of the puzzle, is part of the economic recovery. Of course, not the only instrument, but uh, certainly a very important one. Of course, I want to thank very much uh, the OECD INFE Working Group on the Global Money Week, and especially its leader, uh, Vasco Cavalcanti. Uh, this group has been very active in preparing the Global Money Week uh, this year, and I'd like to thank them. We had a number of, of webinars. It was really instrumental in moving the needle and getting countries enthusiastic about the Global Money Week this year. I'd like also, of course, to thank the many countries that are not necessarily members of the INFE that are also very active uh, this year. And of course, they are welcome to join the INFE in the future. Last but not least, of course, I'd like to thank young people. We heard you. Uh, it was lovely to have your video. I know that there are many, many more activities going on. And it is great to see that you are involved in those issues. And typically, uh, we can learn from you. And as Ellen Sova said as well, we are not, it's not the idea that you only have to learn from us. <laughs> we can also learn from you. And certainly, I'm more active now on social media, and I see that there is a lot going on. So certainly, we, we need to watch that space as well as policymakers. Uh, I want also to thank my team. I'd like to thank the, the OECD team, especially uh, Chiara, Bianca, Edita. I mean, they have been uh, the backbone of, of this initiative. And without them, we wouldn't have a launch and not a week either. So thank you uh, so much. All in all, uh, speaking about the OECD, as you all know, it is the first year that the OECD uh, as the, the coordination is, is as really the stewardship of the Global Money Week. And of course, we take great, great pride in this. We are very happy about that. But we also feel the responsibility, the responsibility, especially in this time of pandemic. And as you have seen, uh, there are a number of things that had to change uh, because of the pandemic, because of the vital importance of financial literacy these days. Uh, the number one uh, difference is, of course, we are all virtual. Uh, all virtual, of course, it allows us to have a global launch today. It allows many countries to be participating in spite of the difficulties. It allows many policymakers to continue to have financial literacy activities in spite of the pandemic. So we've seen a major shift from, of course, in-person financial literacy delivery uh, to virtual. As was mentioned by Magda and many others, obviously, this is a great opportunity. The virtual world is here to stay. We will continue to do financial literacy through digital means. But at the same time, there are risks. And I don't want to repeat them because it's, it's been said very well. There are risk of exclusion. There are risk of fraud, of scams. I was just mentioning social media. Claire is mentioning it as well. There is a lot of fake information and news uh, in the social media. So we need to be very wary, push the opportunities, continue to innovate, but also make sure that part of young population are not excluded uh, from, from uh, receiving financial literacy. And at the same time, make sure that uh, they are not victims of, of the system and of wrong advices. So very important to keep that in mind. And at the OECD, we will continue to work on this. It is one of our key priorities. Second, the main theme of this year edition is take care of yourself take care of your money. And you saw that we put take care of yourself first because taking care of your money will help you taking care of yourself. And we really wanted to make the link uh, between financial literacy and financial well-being. And I would say also health. And Mary just mentioned that 
you know, when you have difficulties with your money, it has an impact on your health. And we've seen that in many countries happen. So for us, it is really at the core of our message. We're not speaking about money, about financial literacy for the beauty of it, or because money is important, but because it is really a, a, a means to achieve a goal, which is increased financial well-being. And of course, we are also committed to continue working on that. Last but not least, of course, we see the Global Money Week as a great opportunity to raise awareness. And actually, with the pandemic, there's been no better time, perhaps, uh, to talk to young people, individuals, small businesses about their finances. Uh, but we see that as a first step. And of course, more needs to be done. Uh, it was mentioned, the Global Money Week is not just a week. It has to be an attitude. It has to be long term. Uh, and of course, uh, we, are, we are very committed to do that. Uh, I said that it is a beginning. And I would like to salute again uh, the creativity of the 100 countries, more than 100 countries that are participating in the Global Money Week in, in this edition. Actually, I could mention a variety of initiatives. I really like the fact that there were a lot of online games. I think there is no better way of learning than by doing. And games are a fantastic opportunity for young people to also experience money without taking risks. So I think this is really great. Virtual visits of museum. There's also radio and TV shows. So not only relying on online activities, social media. We heard that uh, a lot of actually the panelists have mentioned that in their countries, they are doing a, a lot of activity on social media. I think it's a great way to reach out to the young generation. Uh, as I said, we are at the beginning. It is a state of mind, the Global Money Week, as was mentioned by a Majesty Queen Majestima. So at, at the OECD, of course, we will continue to work on this. First, we'll take stock of all the activities that will happen this week and perhaps in the coming week, and we will publish an annual report on the activity of the Global Money Week. So there will be a follow up to that. Second, we will continue to monitor the activities beyond that and especially their impact. Uh, and with the help of the working group of, on the Global Money Week in the INFE, we will come up with new ideas in order to measure successes and impact, which is really, really important, including perhaps through the reintroduction of the financial literacy awards that was existing in the past. So for us, it is really important to continue to measure your success and uh, to, to report back on those. So stay tuned, but also count on us uh, to continue to poke you, to incentivize all of you uh, to do more in terms of financial literacy and evaluation. And in this spirit, I'd like to mention that uh, my team, shall I put a link to an evaluation poll, so uh, to actually assess uh, today's event. So please do not hesitate to fill in the form. It is very important for us to get your feedback. With that, I'd like to say that we need to be bold, to stay the course, in order to make a difference for our younger generation, as well as older generation. So continue to take care of yourself, to take care of your money, and have a happy and very successful Global Money Week. Thank you very much to you all.